I gave you a really good introduction, too. I, I, Thank you. I, I apologize for that. So uh, we already have two yeses, so uh, this is not meatloaf, so two out of three ain't good here. Um, not everybody got that reference, but we don't use that in the Christian ministry very often, meatloaf, and two out of three ain't bad. We're talking about should Iowa actually lead this process, the Iowa caucus process, and Governor DeSantis was just talking about decency and people of faith and taking this serious. What do you think? Is this something that they should do? I think it's what Iowa has always done. You know, and, and the reason why I can respect where Iowa is coming from is South Carolina really holds tight to being the first, you know, state in the South to vote. And I think that looking at it, Iowa gets it's about faith, family, and country. Mm. And it's a great start to a presidential process when that is front of mind for everyone. And then it goes into New Hampshire, and I know by the time it gets to South Carolina, South Carolina is also thinking faith, family, country. And so I think it, I think it makes sense that this is the start. It's always worked well, and you know we're going to all see that play out again. And I think it's right. Oh, good answer. Uh... <laughs> Vivek, anything you'd like to add? Because uh, you said yes, but I want to give you an opportunity to add. Yeah, I mean, I was actually with the group this morning, and I'll tell you what I told them, which was you know, so much of this electoral process takes place through the media, right? Through the filters of cameras, through social media algorithms. I mean, look at today. It's a room full of us here having an open conversation at a table freely speaking. No social media algorithms in the air. No TV screens in the air. And one of the things that I've learned in traveling this country is I actually, I've changed my mind on something since we started in this campaign. When we started in February, I was convinced that we're a nation divided. Okay, the task of uniting this country was going to be monumentally difficult, but that was my purpose, and we wanted to set out and see if we could do it. I've now traveled to a majority of states in this union across Iowa as well. I don't think we're nearly as divided as the media teaches us that we are, right? If you turn on the social media apps on your, on your phone, or you watch cable television on a given night, sure, you're led to believe that we're divided. And I think the way we call the bluff on that national division is all of us starting to speak openly again. Right? There's a gap between what people are willing to say in private and what they're willing to say in public. I think that's the measure of our country's health. How big is that gap? And what I've seen in Iowa, and I think this is why the caucus is what it is. If you asked me a year and a half ago, I would have said I wouldn't know the difference whether Iowa goes first or not. I'm now in first in the nation evangelist because people have, <laughs> and the truth is, I mean, people, people understand that they want to ask the questions straight to your face that even the media won't ask. And that's how our country is supposed to work. And we're going to keep it that way regardless of what the other side does. Awesome. Well said again. So let's start here and just make sure there's no division at this table, you know, because we're at the Thanksgiving table. Families are going to be traveling next week, Thursday. They're going to be celebrating everything that we've been blessed with in this country, gathering around a table like this. Uh, so this is more about you and not about whoever your opponent is, even if it happens to be the former president or President Biden. This is about you. And each one of you will have 28 minutes. You see the clock in front of you. And, and this is one is we're going to have an adult conversation around the table. You know, speak when you want to speak. And when you speak, the time comes off. And when you don't, the time stops. All right? Ronald Reagan said this. So Ronald Reagan said, great change begins at the dinner table. And I don't know, but I look around this country, and I think we've left the dinner table. And not only has our nutrition taken a hit, but passing on the timeless values to our children has taken a hit. How do we, re how do we re restore America's children to the blessings of marriage, to parentings of a mom and a dad, where there's a dad in the household at the table, but to make family central again? How do we do that as a country? I'll, I'll maybe kick off with one reflection. I don't think it's going to be one silver bullet. It's not going to be some president coming from on high and fixing this. I, you know, I'm asking you to, each of us is, to make you that person. But we can't let each other off the hook. It's going to take 
individual responsibility and parental responsibility at every level, but what the government can do is stop paying people to do the opposite of that. I've been to the south side of Chicago, a room like this one. Looks a little different. Told it's 90% plus Democrat, 95% black in that room. Well, they're paying people more money, women more money, not to have a man in the house than to have a man in the house in the name of Lyndon Johnson's great society. So in some ways, you get what you pay for. So there's a whole debate about what role should the government play in fostering family. Let's start with the basics. Stop having a government that's paying people not to actually celebrate or embody the nuclear family. And I think that we talk about education a lot. The nuclear family is where it begins. That's the greatest form of governance known to mankind. And you know, I had the ultimate people ask you, did you grow up in privilege? My parents came to this country with no money. I didn't grow up in economic privilege. But I did have the ultimate privilege of two parents in the house with a focus on education and instilling in us a belief in God. And I think it's perfectly right for us, or whoever's the next president of the United States, to want to set an example such that every kid in this country can enjoy that same privilege. And I don't think we should apologize for it. Mm. You know what? Go ahead, Ambassador. Go ahead. You know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, as a, as a mom and Michael and I as parents, we have one job. It's one job and to make sure that we get our kids right. And so even when I was governor, I made sure we were home and had dinner at least five nights a week together. When I was at the UN, I did the same thing. I wanted us to sit down and have dinner together. And that's when we could find out how their day was. When the kids were little, they would get on my bed and they'd tell me all about their day. And when they stopped sitting on my bed, I started sitting on theirs. <laughs> and that was the way, and Michael and I always wanted out of everything, we said, if we can teach them a faith and a conscience, then they're going to be okay. But I grew up in rural South Carolina where in my town, we didn't know what we didn't have. And you had a lot of parents that either didn't work or both parents worked. And so you had a lot of latchkey kids. Now I have an educational foundation that I started that hits all rural areas in South Carolina to make sure when those kids are done, we have real teachers that help them with their homework, that help them with tests, that make sure that they're going to get home and they're going to be okay. And when I talked to one of my kids um, in those schools, I said, well, what do you like about this program? And he said, I'm not scared to go to class anymore. Hmm. And I knew those parents. If you talk to them, they were so grateful that we were doing what they wanted to do, but they couldn't do. But when I was governor in South Carolina, the focus was, how do we lift up everybody? How do we do something so that we can move them to a better place? So what we did is we had thousands of people on welfare. And so I would take that person who would be sitting on the couch, and I would match them up with a business. And I told my businesses, if you will take this person and train them, I will pay for them for X number of weeks. And after that, you decide if you want to hire them. We moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. <laughs> we would have family celebrations, and those kids would see their parents. And for the first time, their parents were productive members of society. Mm -hmm. But more than that, we broke a generational cycle where their parents had been sitting on the couch and the ones before. Then we went into our prison systems. And I said, I want to know how people get there what happens to them when they're there, and what happens when they go home. And what we did was we reformed the entire prison system. We went and we taught them computer skills. We taught them financial planning. We taught them family planning. We gave them faith-based care if they wanted it. And then we put equipment by, behind the fence, mm. and we taught them a skill. Now in South Carolina, when someone leaves the fence, they've got a job to go to the next day. We have the lowest recidivism rate in the country. The goal is how do you lift up everybody? Mm. Because when you do that, those are longer-term solutions, and that's when you're doing God's work. I truly believe that. Amen. The, the nuclear family, moms, dads, Governor DeSantis, uh, how, how, do you, how do you propose to do this? How do you propose that we do this? Well, one, I just, I'm somebody that's lived through what a blessing it is to, to, to have a family, and I, I reflect on 
before we celebrate Thanksgiving, my wife and I on Wednesday are going to celebrate our oldest daughter's seventh birthday. Mm. And I started looking back and thinking about, uh, you know, we were married, doing, doing our thing. I was in the Navy. She, my wife was busy as a TV reporter. Uh, and, we, and we wanted to have a family. And it didn't happen at first. And so we were like, you know, trying. And then uh, we eventually took a trip to Israel uh, when I was a U.S. congressman. And we literally went to Shiloh with Hannah's prayer. Mm. We went to um, Ruth's tomb in Hebron, Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. Um, and we prayed. We prayed a lot uh, to, to have a family. And then uh, lo and behold, we go back uh, to the United States. And, and a little time later, uh, we, uh, we, we got pregnant. Um, but unfortunately, uh, w we lost that first baby. And um, you know, it was a tough thing because this is something that we had so much uh, hopes for, uh, so much aspirations. But you know, we just kept the faith. We just mm -hmm. kept praying. Uh, we knew that there would be a path that, that God would lead us on. And, and lo and behold, um, you know, short time after, we did it, and we had our first baby girl, and we didn't stop after that. We've got a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter, and we've got a, a big, full, joyous household. Uh, and I think it showed me, one, life has a long and winding road. Keep the faith. But it also told me, you know what? This is special. I've got to fight for these kids and I've got to fight for all these kids. So some of the things that we've done in Florida, I had to go out toe to toe with the most powerful corporation in the state, Disney, because we had actually had a debate about is it okay to inject sexuality and gender ideology in the elementary school curriculums. Uh, and as a father of a six, five and three year old, I knew that was wrong. And I knew if I didn't do everything I could to stand up for that, I was not doing my job uh, as the governor. So, so we did that, and we won that battle, and we have the ideology that's out of the schools uh, right now. Uh, you also look at what is one of, you could fix one thing. There's a lot of things in our society, but if you can fix one thing and just snap your fingers, what I would choose is to make sure every kid had a father in the home. Mm. I think we have a fatherlessness crisis in this country. We in Florida launched the Fatherhood Initiative. Uh, we launched it with some, some nonprofit groups. Uh, one of them was a former coach of the Colts and Bucks, Tony Dungy. And what Tony said, and Tony's a Christian, he would go and he would minister to prisoners when he was the head coach at Tampa. And what he said was he figured out they weren't in prison because of, of socioeconomic race, all the things that most people say. They were in prison because they didn't have a dad in the home. They didn't have somebody... That, that was there and took an interest in them. So we've now worked to, to, to correct that in a variety of ways in the state of Florida, uh, but that is ultimately what it's about. So you should not have any program that disincentivizes family formation, uh, and we should utilize the resources in our society uh, to make sure that that family unit is upheld as, as really the most important unit of government in our society. So. Bob, if I could. Governor DeSantis, if I could just have you tilt your clock a little bit this way. Oh, I got, yeah, yeah. I'm a former basketball coach. got to make sure you're on time. <laughs> um, just add one thing to, to, what, sure. to what Ron said. I, I think that it's tremendous I mean, to have governors who have actually implemented programs that have shown that level of progress. I think that's important. It shows how important policy is. I do think that there is half the job of being U.S. president that actually isn't about policy either. I think this is where this role is a little different than being a congressman or a senator or a legislator, all of which are important roles. But I think part of the role of being the U.S. president is we also set an example for our national character. And I've heard you say something similar to this, Bob, but I believe it too. I think it's been a long time since, certainly speaking for myself, that I could look my two boys in the eye and tell them in good conscience that I want you to grow up and be like him, whoever that is in the White House. And that's the standard I want you all to hold us to, whoever it is, to say, I want you to stand, grow up to be like him or her, whoever that is in the White House, hold us to that standard. And that's half the job of how I think the president stands for family, too, is the example that we set for the next generation. It's not just the policies. And I think that that's something that is about the standard we hold ourselves to, but that our voters hold us to as well. You know, in America, we combine statesmanship and the CEO role together. 
but we, can, we should never forget about being a statesman is what you talked about. Switching gears here, children are a heritage from the Lord, right? And um, so let's talk about the sanctity of human life uh, just a minute. When I grew up, I grew up in a Dutch reform uh, home. Uh, some parents threatened to send their kids to a reform school. <laughs> Mine did, okay? Uh, but they, they didn't give me a choice on whether I was pro-life or pro-choice. They taught me the scriptures that God creates life. God knit us together in our mother wo- mother's womb. Uh, he ordained each day before one came to be. And, you know, so I, I believed that, but it wasn't until our third son, Lucas, who was born with a very rare brain disorder, left him significantly disabled, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, major seizure disorders. To a lot of society, they would say, you know, abort his life. And yet that little boy taught us the most power, powerful sermon for 28 years. And that drove my conviction and my passion for the sanctity of human life. So beyond the talking points, is there a conviction moment for any of you or each of you about this is what drove my commitment to the sanctity of human life? Well, I think a part of the story that I told when, when our um, you know, firstborn was really a, a prayer that had been answered for us, and that was very meaningful. And I'll never forget uh, being in the doctor's office, and they put something over my wife's stomach, and I hear a whoosh, whoosh. whoosh. I'm like, what is that? They're like, that's the heartbeat. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And that was like, I mean, how could you even have a debate at that point? See, I told Darla, he's going to be a basketball player. Swish, <laughs> swish, swish. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you look at that and you're, you're just, that, that is uh, a separate uh, human being uh, yeah. with a beating heart. Uh, and, and I just think about the, the potential uh, that, that we have out there uh, with, with human beings that so many people just want to discard. Not everyone's going to be born into perfect circumstances, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean that people cannot be successful. That doesn't mean people can't uh, have great contributions regardless of the circumstances uh, of their birth. I was, when we had the debate the other day in, in NBC, uh, I told the story about uh, a, young, a young mother in Jamaica who was pregnant and everyone was telling her to get an abortion, so she was going to the abortion clinic and something came over, I, th- I, think, it was, I think it was the Lord, that right at the front door of that clinic turned her around. And so she ended up having a daughter. And look, these are poor people in Jamaica. Some of the talking heads would say, no chance, right? Well, the daughter grew up, uh, got involved in business, and eventually emigrated to the United States. The only reason I know about that story uh, is because that baby girl that was born in those circumstances in Jamaica was somebody that I ended up appointing to the Supreme Court of Florida in 2022. No one would have thought that was possible. But it just shows you the potential uh, of human life. And if we can't stand for a culture of life, then, then we're not worth very much at all. Mm. And that's right here. You know, I, I have always said I'm unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband was adopted. Mm. And so I live with that blessing every day. And we had trouble having both of my children. I, we tried and tried and tried and, and had trouble getting pregnant. And so when you're surrounded by those blessings, you really do see the gift that it is. The gift that, you know, Michael's parents, if they couldn't take care of him, his life still mattered. He still means so much. The gift of my two children, as hard as it was to have both of them. I mean, the blessing that we got from it. You know, I just had one of my girls that works on the team. She just had a baby. And I said, you're not going to believe how big your heart's going to grow. It's going to grow 10 sizes. And so I think anybody who's appreciated that gift of life, you don't take it lightly because you know it's a blessing. And I think that's where mine comes from. Vivek. I mean, I was first persuaded just by the logic of it. I was a scientist, or trained as certainly an undergrad to be a scientist. My wife's a physician. You're kind so, of a logical guy. Let's just go. I like logic first, and that's kind of where I usually reason with, with people who disagree with me on this. We agree as a society. Nobody disputes it. Nobody's going to be protesting on the streets about this to say that life ends on the back end when brainwaves end. Nobody disputes that. 
Well, if we apply that rule on the back end, then that means life begins no later than when brain waves begin. That's five to six weeks. And so the logic of it leads me there. I would say that my, my faith also leads me there, Bob, is that we believe that God resides in each of us. And I would say God taught us that lesson too. I, I actually haven't shared this story before, but I asked about a personal experience, and so I'm, I'm going to dip below the logic here. So poor my wife, you, you and Darla have met several times now. She is a physician. She's a throat surgeon. That's why she's not here right now. She'll be here tonight in Iowa, but she's protecting life now. She's saving lives at the cancer hospital in Ohio State, and she'll be here this evening. But she began her surgical training in 2015, and that's the year we got married. So that's when she entered her five-year residency. And so the year we got married, we made a plan. We had it all planned out. Right? She was going to finish her residency. It was going to be five years in. And then we were going to have our first kid. And then we were going to have our second kid and had it all mapped out perfectly. And I'd say God, showed, God pretty quickly showed us what he thought of that plan <laughs> when he, uh, about halfway through her residency, at the start of her fourth year, blessed us with our first child. And we were ecstatic, actually. And the truth is, I was building my first company at that time. Apoorva was working probably 80 plus hours a week. It's supposed to be capped at 80. They work them more in residency. And so we were going through a, a bit of a rough patch, to be honest with you, just with how much little time we were spending together. That brought us together. We told everybody we knew. We were ecstatic. We told our parents. And we were, weren't expecting the blessing, but we were grateful for it. We told our family members, celebrated with our friends. We actually bought a journal. We did that every night, and that brought us together. We wrote a letter to our child, what we wanted to impart, what were the stories from our parents and our grandparents we wanted to tell. And about three and a half months in, you know, Purva, one day she woke up, she said, I'm bleeding. She had a miscarriage. Hmm. We lost our first child. And that was the loss of a life. It was our family's loss. And you know Purva. She is probably one of the most upbeat, strong, positive people you will meet. She went into a state of depression after that. And our faith is what got us through it, actually. Our faith teaches us that, that you know, our child joined his creator, and one day we will too. But it inspired us to now continue trying. Okay, we, we weren't, It wasn't part of our plan. Well, let's, we knew we wanted that blessing. We asked for it again. So God gave us that blessing a few months later. And... You know, we were nervous this time, but God wasn't done testing us, actually. So she's a surgeon. She's in the operating room. And this rarely ever happens. It's a rare incident. It only happened once in her career. It was this time while she was pregnant. She's operating. There's a second surgeon. Two surgeons are operating. She gets a pinprick, draws blood. And, you know, they look at the patient's tests afterwards just to make sure. And what do you know? That patient is HIV and HBV hepatitis B positive. Mm. So she goes into antiretroviral therapy, gets a hepatitis B vaccination again. Already had it, the start of her job, get it again. This is not good during your pregnancy, especially when our first one ended the way that it did. And so we were nervous. So I'm traveling abroad for work a few weeks later, maybe about a month or so later. And then I get the call that we dreaded. Mm -hmm. Poor was on the phone, she's crying. She said she was bleeding. And we lost our child in a miscarriage. And the thing that infuriated me also at the time was she couldn't even get an appointment until three days later. It was, it was our healthcare system. And so one thing if I know how to do is cut through bureaucracy. I'm, I'm abroad. I do what I do, make the phone calls needed. She got an appointment the next day. And I told her to call me after she was out. And so the next day I was waiting for a call. She goes in for the doctor's appointment. I get the call. She's crying. I'm getting ready to console her. And she said they found a heartbeat. Mm. That was our son. That was our son, Carthy. We could mm. probably leave him there. Mm. <laughs> and that was alive, right? Mm. It's this guy right here. 
And you can sit up here, you sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's what gives us our commitment. I mean, yeah, there's the logic of it, yeah. but when you bring life into this world, you protect all life, born and unborn. And that's where our commitment comes from, and I think that you know God taught us that the, uh, through a different way than we had planned, but that's where we've landed, and we'll always protect life for that reason. Vivek, thank you for sharing thank that you. story. Thank you. Really, thank you for sharing that story. You know, when you're... When, 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 when you're when, 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 so part of loving our neighbors ourselves is showing honor and respect. And here we will show honor and respect. Um, you made a comment, though, Vivek, that I want to capture on, is that, you know, you made plans. And a lot of times I hear, you know, men make plans and God laughs, right? A lot of us had plans in the early part of 2020, okay? And we did not see a worldwide pandemic coming. Matter of fact, you guys are running for president. And if you take a look at George W. Bush, when he was campaigning in Iowa in 2000, nobody was asking about what's going to happen when 9-11 happens, but it happens. And now you get tested with the unexpected. Nobody was questioning President Trump in 2016, what are you going to do with a worldwide pandemic? But you get tested with the unexpected. So my question to the three of you is, what did we learn from COVID and how can, how can this audience trust you with our safety and with our freedom with the next unexpected crisis? Well, uh, um, you can trust me because um, uh, I, I've done it. <laughs> and I stood up and did what was right. And, and there weren't a lot. Uh, your governor in Iowa was one of them that stood up and, and did what was right. And what bothers me is how wrong all these people were. Uh, all these agencies, the federal government, Fauci, on almost everything about this, um, about these lockdowns, masks, school closures, uh, vax mandates, on and on down the line, they were wrong about these things. And it, it was obvious pretty early on when guys like me and Governor Reynolds were saying, no, all the kids need to be in school, businesses need to be open, all this other stuff. Uh, we were the ones that were getting lambasted by the left, by the media, and even by a lot of Republicans. I mean, I had the Trump administration attacking me for having kids in school. They were telling me to close things down even in January of 2021 on their way out of office. So that's just what happened. And uh, you had to just stand strong for, for what you believed in. And I'll never forget, people like Fauci were trying to tell people not to go to church. So I had some local governments that were trying to not let people go to church. So I immediately did an executive order, said you have the right to worship, and government cannot infringe your right to worship. And it's very important that we do that. So it's easy to lead when the wind's at your back. The question is, is when you're leading into the teeth of the media machine, the bureaucracy, the left, all these different things, are you going to be willing uh, to stand strong or are you going to fold your tent? Uh, and I'm somebody that's shown as governor, not just on that issue of COVID, uh, not just on parents' rights, how we've responded to hurricanes, how we handled the BLM riots. We didn't have them in Florida because I called out the National Guard and said, it's not going to happen in my state. So, so we've been able to handle these crises. Obviously, our state is, is doing as well as it's ever done in our history. But I can tell you what I can promise as president. I am going to bring a reckoning to these agencies for what they did to this country during COVID. <laughs> CDC, NIH, FDA, Anthony Fauci, all these people we are going to hold accountable. Why? Because if we don't hold them accountable, they are going to try to do it again. And we can never let this happen in our country ever again. 
Pastor Haley will talk about this. When you look back at what happened at COVID, I think there were obviously a lot of things that went wrong. But the first thing that I noticed went wrong is you had multiple people saying multiple things. And you never want that to happen in a crisis. So, you know, Ron can relate to this. When we would have, and, and South Carolina had our share of tragedies, I mean, constantly from hurricanes to a church shooting to school shooting. I mean, we, we really went through a lot together. But when you had a hurricane, the one thing I always did was I told South Carolinians the truth. I told them everything I knew. And so I would have press conferences twice a day. And I would give them every bit of information so that they could make the best decision for their family. That's the way you're supposed to handle a crisis. Because when you go through it, you're not living people's lives for them. You're giving them the information so that they feel empowered to make the decisions that they wanted. And so I would tell them, this is what we know about when it's going to hit. This is what we think the storm surge is going to be. This is how you can best protect yourself and your family. This is what I'm doing for my family. This is what you could do. And I think when you look at COVID, you had multiple voices saying multiple things. So people didn't trust any of it. Then you went and had something unprecedented where you literally didn't allow people to decide what they wanted to do. So you had small businesses. If they wanted to open up, they should have been able to open up. If customers want to walk in that door, they make that decision to walk in that door. We should have allowed the economy and people to continue to move. And that didn't happen. And you shut it down. And then, by the way, you said, you better take this shot or you can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It really was an unprecedented disrespect of the American people and the freedoms that we hold dear. And we can never let that happen again. Right. I mean, one thing is, and I, I do want to recognize outstanding governors like yours here, Ron as well, holding a line on a craze that spread across this country. I, the only thing I would add to, I think, the good points that both of them have made is that two core lessons. One is the next time we have a crisis, Freedom of speech is most important, not in ordinary times, but in times of crisis. If you had been allowed to say that we shouldn't lock down those schools, those schools would have never been locked down. If you have been allowed to say the virus originated in a lab in China, we would have known that much sooner and been able to take action based on it. And the second principle is medical freedom, that you get the choice to determine whether or not you take a vaccine regardless of how that government pushed it through. And so, so those are the policy points. I think that there is something deeper though if we scratch beneath the surface and we got to be careful not just to point at the government a lot of accountability there but we have to ask a hard question what is it inside each of us that made us not maybe not the people in this room but us as a society what is it that made us want to bend the knee right, you think about I mean this is this is the stuff of scripture I picked it up in St. X high school Catholic school in Cincinnati you and I've talked about this Bob when the Israelites left the Pharaoh, they escaped from the Pharaoh, they're lost in the desert, yet to find the promised land. What do they say? We want to go back and be ruled by the Pharaoh. So we can spend our time talking about the Pharaoh, and that's important. But it's a lot harder to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what is it that made us want to bend the knee? And now COVIDism gone, is it any accident that climatism is now here? So I think that this is a deeper conversation in our country. And I, in some ways, I'm speaking as a member of my generation. I'm 38. I'm the youngest person ever to run in our party for U.S. president. And I can tell you what's certainly going on in our generation. I saw my generation's response to COVID. Usually, it's the young people that are sticking it to the man. Here's the young people that are actually running to be compliant. What the heck is going on? It is that we are starved for purpose and meaning and identity at a time in our national history when faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared and that leaves a black hole in our hearts. I think it was Pascal speaking to scientists, he was the one who said if there's a hole the size of God in your heart and God does not fill it, something else will instead. We're going to bend the knee to something. You don't pledge allegiance to the U.S. flag. You're going to pledge allegiance to a different flag. That's what I think actually happened during COVID, mm -hmm. is it was a symptom and it revealed 
that we were hungry to be part of something bigger than ourselves. It was COVIDism for two years. That's why we let the government infringe on our liberties the way they did. And now it's the climate, and then it's going to be the next thing. But we're going to have the next thing until we fill that void with the real thing. And I think that that's something that you know, we can run from the other thing, wokeism, transgenderism, COVIDism, climatism. I think we've got to start running to something, individual, family, nation, God. And I think that's what I want to see this Republican Party and this conservative movement actually stand for something. And I think once we do that, we're not going to have COVIDism next time around. Mm -hmm. So. That's a good conversation at the Thanksgiving table. I do want to give a shout out to Governor Reynolds because what she did for us in Iowa is she treated us like adults. Kind of, she treated us like adults. And she allowed us to make our own decisions. But I guarantee you, whoever swears or you know, puts their hand on the Bible and takes that oath of office, something unexpected is going to come. And our safety but our freedom is exceptionally important to that next leader. Let me turn the page here a little bit. And this is going to be not the what or the how, but it's going to be the why. So on October 7, um, Israel experienced exponential 9-11s. And you're seeing anti-Semitism rise up across this country, college campuses, all across. I mean, you look at Europe and other places. And it gets to me that we have forgotten why we stand with Israel. So my question for, this, for us at the table is that why do we stand with the nation of Israel? Not what, not how, but why do we stand with them? I think there's a number of reasons. One... Uh, they're our only tried and true ally in the entire Middle East. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. They're the only country in that region that, that shares our values. Uh, we have a great economic relationship. We have great cultural ties. Uh, and that's been true for the uh, 75 plus years that they've been in existence. But Israel is a special country because our entire civilization, Western civilization, was birthed in the Holy Land. We are based on the Judeo-Christian tradition. You would not have the United States of America uh, if you did not have the thousands of years of history uh, that is represented in the Bible. And if you go to Israel and you take out your Bible, you can walk exactly what is recorded there. It is real history. And that is just something that's unique. There's no other country uh, that would have that type of resonance uh, with us uh, given uh, the, the history where you have, the, obviously, the Old Testament and then the birth of Christianity. So, and I, if, for those of you who've gotten to go, I know, Bob, you've gone. Uh, it will change you when you walk in the Amen. footsteps of where Jesus walked. You can walk in the, in the different, I mean, my son came with us. He loves David and Goliath. We, we literally were in Israel in, in April. You can go to the valley where David fought Goliath. So it all, it all comes to life, uh, and it's all something that, that's very, very meaningful. And, and I think it just carries with it a significance that is unlike any place uh, I've ever been to. But the one thing you notice, if Israel was not in charge of those sites, you would not have the freedom to go celebrate um, at any of those sites. The, the, the Arabs would not allow that. In fact, Bethlehem is controlled by the Palestinian Arabs. And so there, there's a church where you can go where they, they, they say is where, um, uh, where Christ was born. And it's a beautiful church, but you walk out. Well, first of all, it, there's, it's like a pigsty, the city. It's not well kept. And then they built this massive mosque right in front of it to like tower over it. So the Israelis are caretakers of the most important history that we have. Mm. I'll give you a, uh, it's a complimentary answer to Ron's, maybe slightly different, which is, I've also been to the Holy Land. It, it's moving to be there. I mean, seeing the traditions enshrined and walking around the streets of Jerusalem. I will say this, though. For me... I guess I'll start with the family. My moral obligation as a father is to our boys and toward my family, period. And I'm not going to apologize for that or waver in that. My moral obligation as the next president is to the United States of America. And so why I support is you ask the why, and it's a good question. Here's why. Because it's in the interest of the United States of America. And I think that that's the moral hat that I wear. I think that's my moral clarity as the president. 
Because Israel is our ally, we can focus on adversaries from other parts of the world, China or elsewhere. We need Israel for that reason. And so I look at everything through the prism of certainly wearing my hat as a presidential candidate and the future president, if you all put us there, put me there. It is what exclusively advances the interests of American citizens here in the homeland, and that is why we stand with Israel. And I think it's the strongest basis for our long-run commitment to Israel as well. Ambassador Haley. You know, I, first of all, I, my family, we all went to Israel. If you haven't been, you should go with your family. It's life-changing. That's yeah. an understatement. And I've been... Go well, on a tour with the family leader. To, <laughs> to, <laughs> it really is. It's, it's quite special. You know, what haunts me about what happened on October 7th is because five years ago I gave a speech at the United Nations in front of the entire world. And that speech said that we know there are maps and we know Hamas has these maps. And what these maps show is if they can get through the barrier, this is where they're going to go to kill as many Jews as fast as they can. And so I'm haunted that it happened. Mm -hmm. And you see, you know, everything that, that Ron said about, like, the biblical and, and, and the historical aspect of it and the faith-based part of it. You see what happened. And this was the game that I saw every time at the United Nations, every single day. <clears throat> Everybody runs to Israel when she gets hit. But you got to support her when she hits back, too. What happened on October 7th? First of all, I've fought for Israel every day because it was the right thing to do. It is literally a bright spot in a tough neighborhood. We share the same values. We share the same democracy. Everything about Israel, we could have no better ally than Israel. But to see what happened on October 7th, what should haunt all of us, is they didn't just kill these people. They tortured them. They beheaded these people. They burned these babies alive. When they got those girls at the concert and they raped them, they dragged their naked bodies down the streets of Gaza. And what did they say? Death to Israel, death to America. And what I want America to know, it's never been that Israel needs America. It's always been that America needs Israel. And we have to remember that. And I'll just say, God help us if we don't get this right. Yeah. We need to give Israel whatever she needs whenever she needs it. No questions asked. We need to eliminate Hamas, and we need to do everything we can to get those hostages home. So there's been a lot of focus on Israel. But let me go to a country that's not getting a lot of focus. Uh, Armenia is the world's first Christian nation. It's home to the Bible Mount of Noah, uh, Mount Ararat. It, is, it faces an existential threat. Armenia has withstood centuries of Muslim persecution and is the only remaining Christian nation in the Middle East. In September, the Islamic nation of Azerbaijan cleansed 120,000 American Christians and publicly stated its intention to conquer all of Armenia. And my question is, why don't we hear anything? Why, why has it been so silent from the U.S. on this front? These, these are friends and allies as well. It's right here in Armenia. And then how would you ensure that this bastion of ancient Christianity is safeguarded? Bob, I, the only thing I would say is I've tried not to be silent about it. Been about as vocal as I can about this issue on the presidential campaign trail. A different part of the Russian periphery that you don't hear about. I'm going to give you the uncomfortable truth of why I think that is. It's Christians who are being persecuted. That's the answer. There's certain classes right now in the intersectional hierarchy that are lower on the totem pole of who you're supposed to be concerned about, and Christians aren't high on that hierarchy. That's the truth. I'm going to share another uncomfortable truth. It's a little controversial, but it's why you don't hear about the Christians being persecuted in Ukraine. Last week or two weeks ago, the legislature banned the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It's the same pattern. Now, in Armenia... You have 1994 as the year of the Budapest Memorandum. You hear a lot about that. 1994 was also the year the international community recognized that Nagorno-Karabakh, the Artsakh region, 
was an autonomous region. Two months ago, this September, where's our media? Where's both of our political parties? Armenia just steamrolls right through 120,000 Armenian Christians, the oldest Christian nation in the world, displaced. And here's the even dirtier little secret at the heart of that. We're paying for it in both cases, in Ukraine, but also in Azerbaijan, because the Azerbaijani lobby has succeeded in actually getting a lot of money, Section 907 exemptions and otherwise, to send U.S. arms to Azerbaijan. It is shameful. And so I think that we need to stand for what's true and right, not by intervening militarily, but by opening our eyes to the truth that we already have intervened militarily by sending our money and our arms to Azerbaijan, and it's wrong. And I think whether it's wrong, whether you're the persecution of Christians in Ukraine to Armenia, I think that it's time to stand up for what's actually right and not just what the media is feeding us to pay attention to. Governor DeSantis. If the roles were reversed, the media would be panicking about what's going on there. And I agree with Vivek. I think that how they treat persecutions of Christians is much different than how they would treat persecutions of others. I think you also see the same in how they're treating the Israelis that are fighting back. Um, people say a ceasefire. You know, there was a ceasefire on the morning of October 7th. They had already agreed to one, and Hamas broke it. So Israel's just supposed to sit there and let their people get massacred and not respond? So you have these moral panics when it fits the narrative uh, of the elites, but when it doesn't, uh, you don't. So I, I think the United States uh, uh, should be standing for the, the Christians in Armenia. I think that it's a noble cause. Hmm. You know, at, one of the, the things we focused on the most, um, you know, along with everything else when I was at the United Nations, was the persecution of Christians and religious liberty. And we always fought for religious liberty. And there were, I remember there was a um, resolution they tried to pass multiple times that would allow the investigations of ISIS in Iraq. And there were many Christians that were persecuted there. And they couldn't get it done and they couldn't get it done. And I negotiated with Iraq to get the investigations open for Christians as well as Yazidis that was happening at the time. The media didn't want to talk about that. You know, it's, it wasn't anything we, you know, anything that we did for religious freedom, whether it was the Rohingya in Burma, whether it was, you know, that the fact that one of the things we focused on that was so important was when we got that resolution done, we wanted all of the aid to go help those Christians, help those Christian organizations in Ukraine. We wanted to go directly to the organizations which were like Samaritan's Purse and others, mm -hmm. rather than going through the UN and doing that. And, you know, Mike Pence was a good part of that, and we did that, and we were able to do that. But, again, they didn't talk about those. You didn't hear them talking a whole lot about Israel. The thing is, if you go back and look at any country, any country that doesn't respect religious liberty, you usually are going to see conflict happen. You're going to see that happen. The only thing that I'll say is that we have to always look at, when you look at the persecution of Christians or anyone, we have to call it out for the human rights issues that it is. No matter where it is, no matter who it is, you have to call it out. Because the media doesn't pick it up, for me, I'm not surprised because they never picked it up a day I was at the United Nations. But does that mean we shouldn't fight for it? No, you should always fight for it. What happened in Azerbaijan is, is a travesty. And you see what happened there. And we're going to see it happen in other countries. But we have to continue to call things out like that when we see it. And you're not going to hear Biden talk. Sorry, I wasn't supposed to mention <laughs> it. You're not, you're not going to hear them talk about that. Yep. But the reality is it goes back to what our values are. And our values are if we ever see Christians persecuted anywhere, don't just say it, but what actions are we going to do behind it? Mm. And we should be calling out Azerbaijan and we should be talking about it. But it also goes to the fact of we should be focused on who it is that we're helping and who it is that we're supporting. Why do we support countries that we support? And it goes back to I strongly believe we need to be looking at where our foreign aid goes. Amen. Because when I was at the United Nations and we moved the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, we were condemned by the entire world. 
and I was proud to do the U.S. veto and let them hear my say on that. But I was so angry, I went to my office and I said, I want you to come up with a book. I want you to list all 193 countries at the U.N. I want the second column to be the percentage of times they voted with the U.S. and against the U.S. And I want the third column to be how much foreign aid we gave them. And I took that book and I gave it to President Trump. And he lost his mind. He's slipping out pages. He's yelling out countries. And what I said to him was... How could this be? He was. He was yelling it all. Sorry, I stop, I stop. All right. Go, go ahead. <laughs> it was quite the scene. It really was. He's flipping pages. He's yelling out countries. And I said, look, I'm not saying that you give foreign aid based on a percentage vote of the UN. But that should be one of the things we look at. Quit trying to buy friends. Quit paying off enemies. You know, we gave $50 billion last year in foreign aid. Do you know who we gave it to? Iraq, who harbored terrorists that tried to kill our soldiers. Zimbabwe, the most anti-American African country there is. We gave money to Belarus, who's holding hands with Russia as they invade Ukraine. We gave money to Cuba, who's, we named a state sponsor of terrorism who's put a spy base up off the coast in Cuba. And we get, this is the one that makes me sick to my stomach. We gave money to China. When I am president, we will no longer give money to countries that hate America. We can't have that anymore. Let's dial in a little bit closer to home. You guys have been traveling to Iowa a lot. Uh, and we're glad to have you as temporary taxpaying citizens uh, <laughs> to do that. Um, but Sukup Manufacturing is one of our premier partners for this uh, Thanksgiving Family Forum. And they're a global leader in the egg industry. And my question is, what is the vision? When you think of national security, what is the vision that we can continue to feed and fuel ourselves in this country? You know, I will tell you, Food security is national security. We can never forget that. And it's getting to the point now that we're starting to import way more food than we should be importing, and we need to be focused on what we're going to do. The biggest issue is, um, you know, I think when you look at food security, you know, if you have to look at, I mean, you, you can't not look at the fact that China is coming up and buying up all of our farmland. They're stealing our seed technology. I mean, we see they bought the largest pork producer in the country right here in Iowa. And all of this that's happening, we've got to put an end to it. And so the first thing is, you know, I think that we have to go not only stop selling them land, but take back the land they already purchased. That's the first thing we have to do. The second thing is we need to make sure we're focused on what do we do if China is a big partner here. Obviously, we want to partner with the farmers here on biofuels and biodiesel. That's a big part of the agricultural community here in Iowa. But let's also look at the fact that a lot of agricultural products are sent to China. And what a president needs to do is exactly what a governor needs to do. You sell your businesses. You sell the products that you make. So I would always sell our products, not just bring companies into South Carolina, but sell what we had out of South Carolina. The one thing we have to do is protect our farmers on this because they send so much to China. What we will focus on is moving that over to our friends. Have that go to India. Have that go to our other allies so that farmers never feel beholden on an enemy. Instead, they have another place to go. And if we go and we do that, we're never having to worry about China in the state of Iowa or anywhere. Is we should assume if they pulled the rug out from under us tomorrow, would we be ready? And to keep Iowa ready, what we should do is make sure that we're dominant when it comes to energy, but make sure we're also taking care of our farmers before something happens and start moving those partnerships over to countries that are our friends. You know, um, India gave themselves a billion dollar stimulus to become less dependent on China. Japan did the same thing, a billion dollar stimulus to become less dependent on China. We need to be talking to all of them and say, Look at what we have. We'll give you this so that you don't have to deal with China as well. It's a perfect opportunity for us to solidify with our partners. That's good. Governor DeSantis. So in Florida, I ban China from buying land in our state. No, no agriculture, no land near military bases. 
We also kick them out of our universities, things like these Confucius Institutes where they will uh, use that to spew Communist Party propaganda on American colleges. And they've done a lot to exert power over our society. I mean, you saw that what they did in California, uh, San Francisco, they even cleaned the poop off the streets to be able to have President Xi Jinping from China come. And you look at how Biden, very deferential to him, you had, uh, he got a hero's welcome by a lot of American CEOs. Um, I thought that that was totally unacceptable. So our agriculture industry is part of our national security of this country. Uh, we need to be able to produce our own food. We do not want Chinese and other hostile countries to be involved in it. We also need to look to see some of the policies that they're trying to do from Washington that's going to be bad, particularly for this part of the country, like forcing electric vehicles on anybody. That is not going to be good for electric... For, for it's not going to be good for liquid fuels. It's not going to be good for consumers. You're going to pay way more uh, as a result of those mandates. They, they did, uh, California and, um, uh, and, and Washington have, they're even going more aggressive in California. We may talk about this when I debate Gavin Newsom on November 30th, so just be ready for that when we do that. But they are in so California. Who, who are you debating? Governor, <laughs> Governor oh, Newsom okay. of California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you never know who they're going to roll out in November of 2024. But um, so California recently announced all new vehicles must be electric by a date pretty close in the future. You can't buy a new car once that mandate goes into effect. Two days later, they issued an announcement. All electrical vehicle owners in California, do not plug in your, your vehicle. We don't have grid capacity. And I'm thinking to myself, this is so ridiculous, but it'll be bad for this region. It'll also bankrupt the auto manufacturers because people don't want these cars. So it just shows you what they're doing uh, doesn't make any sense. But if you talk about national security, yes, the food security, energy production here in the United States is one of the best things we can do to bolster our national security. We have more resources here than anywhere else in the world. We should be energy dominant. We should never go hat in hand to Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or any of these countries. Let's produce it here. We'll, re we'll reverse Biden's Green New Deal on day one and open everything up so that people can pay less for gas. We have lower energy prices across the board and we are stronger as a country as a result of that. Yeah. So, I'll, to add to the good points that have been made, I think the WOTUS regulations, Waters of the United States, and what that does for farmers across this country need to be reexamined, and the administrative state's overreach from the EPA or those three-letter government agencies on down, much of those are unconstitutional overreaches. So I agree with everything that's said about China, but we got to actually get our own house in order for what we're doing to our own ag industry, the damage we're inflicting on ourselves. Now, as it relates to our dependence on China, I mean, the basic rule is we cannot depend on an enemy for our modern way of life. And so I'll sit across the table from Xi Jinping, have a very different meeting than the one Biden had. You won't buy land in this country. You won't donate to universities in this country. We won't actually even be in the WTO anymore. And we will hold you accountable for, this is not related to ag, but it's related to China, and it's important. We will hold you accountable using every financial lever we have for unleashing that man-made virus on the world, or else we can expect even worse in the future. And I think this is what it takes to think on the timescales of history rather than just on the timescales of convenience for tomorrow. Hmm. Well said. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, because uh, I'm taking a look at the time, and you guys are eating up more time than I thought you would that quick, but it's going really well, so thank you. <laughs> is, as I take a look at the Iowa caucuses, I, I feel like I have a pretty good pulse on this base. And this base is going to show up at the Iowa caucuses, and they're going to cast a vote, and they're going to bring a lot of others with them. And I think it's only fair to address what I believe is your highest hurdle from what I'm hearing. Now, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just saying this is what I hear, the highest hurdle. And, and Mr. Ramaswamy, let's begin with you. You and I have discussed before as well. We don't share the same faith. I'm a Christian. You're, you're a Hindu. And you've centered your campaign on truth. Yes. So a question a lot of the caucus goers have is, what truth? Yes. Where do you find it? Where do you discover it? And then how do you discern it and how do you apply it? I think it's a question I'm grateful for, Bob, actually, because we have gone to probably hundreds of events across this state, and we get a lot of questions on policy. 
and it does feel like a bit of an elephant in the room, and so I'm grateful for the chance to talk about faith, actually. My faith is what gives me my freedom. In many ways, my faith is what led me to this presidential campaign, actually. I'll tell you about why, but let me just tell you about my faith. I haven't talked about this on the campaign trail yet. I'll tell you my faith. I'm Hindu. I believe there's one true God. I believe God put each of us here for a purpose. My faith teaches me that we have a duty, a moral duty, to realize that purpose, that we're God's instruments. He works through us in different ways, but we are still equal because God resides in each of us. That's the core of my faith. I grew up in a pretty traditional household. You'd certainly call, I think, a traditional household. My parents taught me family is the foundation. Respect your parents. Marriage is sacred. Abstinence before marriage is the way to go. Adultery is wrong. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Divorce is not just some preference you opt for. That when you get married, you make get married before God, and you make an oath to God, and you make an oath to your family, that the good things in life involve a sacrifice, that there's more to life than the aimless passage of time. We're here for a purpose, and we pursue that purpose. Now, is that a foreign set of values? Is that a strange set of values? I think it is if you look at parts of America today. I mean, turn on the TV. Go to the movie theater. Go to your local HR session in your corporate DEI training. We I mean, fired that department. Look, thank you. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great service you did. Right? I mean, you could go to universities. Go to what they're teaching your kids in public schools. That would feel like foreign values, but I don't think they're foreign values to most Americans in this country. I don't think they're foreign values to those of us who are in this room today. And that's what I would say is that so I learned this. I went to Christian high school, St. X in Cincinnati. What do we learn? We read the Ten Commandments. We read the Bible, Scriptures class. God is real. There's one true God. Don't take his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Respect your parents. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness on your neighbor. Don't covet. Don't commit adultery. What I learned during that time, and I was a young person at that time, is that these values... They're familiar to me. They don't belong to Hindus. But these values, they don't belong to Christians either. They belong to God, actually. And I think they are the values that undergird our country. And so can I be a president who promotes Christianity across this country? I can't for a number of reasons. I'm not Christian. I don't think that's actually what we should want the U.S. president exactly doing either. That's a job for pastors and others who need to carry that out. But will I stand for those fair values, for those shared values? Will I promote them in the example that we set, revive them in the next generation of Americans? You're darn right I will because that's my duty, and I think God put us here for a purpose. And one, one aspect of my faith that I'll just comment on, Bob, is one of our teachings is that we don't choose who God chooses to work through. That's not our choice. That belongs to God. And again, when at St. X High School, when we read the book of Isaiah, that was familiar to me. Mm. God chose Cyrus. He was a Persian. He was all the way in Persia, a Gentile, that led the Jews back to the promised land. And so we'll find out what God's plan is, and we will do our part in realizing it. But that's what led me to this campaign, called me into this as our sense of duty and purpose. And so, yes, we are founded on Judeo-Christian values. They're values that I deeply share, not as a pastor, but as a president. I think it's my responsibility to make faith and family and hard work and patriotism, but faith included, cool again in this country for the next generation and for these boys. Thank you for being transparent with that. You. Thank you. you know, I do believe a foundational question we have is, is there a God or isn't there a God? And if there is a God, we should return to his principles and his precepts, and that's where you will get your unity. But if it's further you go away from his principles and precepts, that's where you will get chaos and division at the Thanksgiving table. Yes, amen. Um, Ambassador Haley, um, what, what I heard, and this is just recent, is uh, in the Miami debate, which was I think last week Wednesday, 
you gave an impassioned answer on life, un unapologetically pro-life. And you talked about how to message it, and that we're deeply divided. And it's a pers I had some pro-lifers say, that sounded like a pro-choice answer. Can you assure them why that's not a pro-choice answer? I think you can look at <clears throat> my entire record as governor. I fought for life, whether it was a pain-capable bill, whether it was making sure that women had to wait, uh, see an ultrasound before they made a decision, um, all the things that we did to focus on life as governor at the United Nations. They said that I was the most pro-life ambassador they had ever had represent the U.S. at the United Nations because we did everything we could to make sure, one, our taxpayer dollars never went towards anything that would take that life away or abortion. And we always tried to do what we could to make sure that we honored the sanctity of life. So my record is strong on a very pro-life record. What you heard me say at the debate was very much my truth. I am unapologetically pro-life. I am so blessed in my life with my husband and my children. But it is important that we remember what's our overall goal. Our overall goal is how do we save as many babies as possible and support as many moms as we can. So you look at this debate that's happened and it's worth looking at how we got here. Prior to 1973, you had 46 state laws and they had 46 ways of dealing with an abortion. And unelected justices threw that all away and said abortion anytime, anywhere, for any reason. Now a wrong has been made right, and it's put back in the hands of the people, which is where it belongs. In some cases, some states have gone more pro-life. I was one of those. It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. In other cases, these states have gone more pro-choice. I wish that wasn't the case, but the people decided. But if we're going to have this conversation about the federal law, we do need to tell people the truth because it is causing division and demonizing in an issue that's incredibly personal to every woman and every man. That if you're gonna pass a federal law, you have to have a majority of the House, you have to have 60 Senate votes, you have to have the signature of a president, and we haven't had 60 Republicans in over 100 years. We may have 45 pro-life senators. So we can't ban abortions on the Republican side any more than the Democrats can ban these state laws. So if we're focused on how do we save as many babies as possible, then let's come together and say, what can we do? Can't we go and say, let's ban late-term abortions? Wherever we can get those 60 votes, we're saving more than we wouldn't otherwise. And can't we say that we should encourage adoptions and good quality adoptions? And can't we say doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? But can't we also say that women who do have an abortion aren't going to go to jail or get the death penalty? The key in this, though, is look at what the parties have done to something this sensitive. The Democrats have put pe fear in the lives of young women and women everywhere. And Republicans have dealt with this on judgment. Our job is not to scare people or to judge people. I don't judge anyone for being pro-choice, but I don't want them to judge me for being pro-life. So we need to focus on this, not by demonizing this issue, but by humanizing this issue. And I did. I had a roommate in college, and she was raped. And I'm telling you, I would not wish that on anybody to see what she went through wondering if she was pregnant. But everybody has a story. And when you're dealing with something this personal, let's deal with it with respect instead of division. That's not going to get us anywhere. Because when you deal with it res with respect and make it personal, you're going to bring more people to you instead of pushing people away. I'm trying to bring more people to us to have the conversation of how do we save as many babies as possible and support as many moms as possible. So it is not, yes, I am pro-life, but I'm trying to get more people to be in our situation than less. So I'm going to make a comment. That I've got one other question because I think this will help clarify, I think, for the caucus scores. First of all, when Roe v. Wade got overturned, right away at the family leader, we have a great church outreach program. You know, 2,400 churches, one of the most vibrant church ministries in the country. And we said, what an opportunity for the church. 
What an opportunity for the church to be the hands and feet to, to meet these women in crisis, to save the baby's life, but also to be there for the mom, to be there for the dad, to hold the dad accountable and responsible. What an opportunity for the church. So we think this is a great opportunity for the church. You mentioned Governor Reynolds, so I'm just going to, you don't get to respond, but <laughs> you mentioned Governor Reynolds. We're thrilled to have her as governor. The former president called signing a heartbeat bill too harsh. If you were governor in South Carolina and that came to your desk, would you sign a heartbeat bill? Yes, whatever the people decide, you should go. I think it's right to be in the hands of the people. I think that the people decided this was put in the states. That's where it should be. Everybody can give their voice to it. And if that's where, and I can tell you, that's where the people of South Carolina decided. They decided to be at six weeks as well. And that's why I'm saying when we find these states that are more pro-life, it's a blessing. We should mm. welcome that. And, but in order to get those people that are going on the other side, We've got to continue to pull them in and keep talking to them about how we want to save as many babies as we can. And, and real quick, I'm just going to add lib. I'm not running for president, but just add lib real quick. What happened in Ohio was a travesty. That is probably the worst amendment I've ever seen. Yes, it, is. it is abortion up to the time of birth. Taxpayers paying for it. Parents don't get to know about it. So we need to have a clear and effective messenger on this issue. But I think we also need to be reining in the Governor Newsom's in California and those others who are making their state an abortion destination. And I pray one day, as president, you, people would have a bill on their desk standing up for the sanctity of human life. <clears throat> Governor DeSantis, what, what I've heard of, about your campaign, uh, the Iowa poll, the Iowa poll came out, showed you a distant second. You dig deeper into the poll and you see that you are the second choice for Trump voters and your voters, the second choice is Trump, okay? And so the biggest comment or the biggest question is, why doesn't he just wait his turn? Why doesn't he wait his turn, stay, stay being governor of Florida? Why is this your time? Why is this the time is now? Because you're going to have to make that close by January 15th. Well, we're a republic. It's not about waiting your turn. You have a right as a citizen to put your name out there and to fight for the country that you believe in. And we have a, a situation in our country where we are in jeopardy of turning over to the next generation of Americans an America less prosperous and less free than the America we inherited. And if that's the case, we'll be the first generation of Americans in the entire history of our country to do that. My wife and I have a six, five, and three-year-old at home. Uh, we're not just going to sit idly by and watch the managed decline of this country. If we have the ability to offer ourselves as the leader to be able to get things done, we will do that. You compare uh, Donald Trump uh, with, with me. I delivered on 100% of my promises as governor of Florida. There wasn't a single thing I didn't deliver on. We delivered on right to life. We delivered on Second Amendment. We delivered on school choice. We delivered on getting rid of CRT and transgender ideology. We banned the surgery, transgender surgeries for minors in the state of Florida. We have a crime rate at a 50-year low because we've done things like authorize the death penalty for pedophiles. So on issue after issue, I have delivered on these principles in a way, quite frankly, if you look at Donald Trump's uh, campaign in 16 and then compare his rhetoric now, he's campaigning on the things he promised to do in 2016 and didn't deliver. He said he would build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. That did not happen. We would not have 8 million people that Biden would have been able to let in if we had a wall that had been built. He said he was going to drain the swamp. The swamp is worse than ever. We have weaponized federal agencies and they are running amok. Uh, he said he was going to eliminate the national debt. Uh, starting with COVID in particular, we have the worst fiscal situation this country's happened, $7.8 trillion um, on his watch. So I think we need somebody that's going to fight. And I think Donald Trump was somebody that came and said he'd fight for us. But we also need somebody that's going to win. Somebody that's going to win for you and win for your family. And yes, that involves, of course, winning the election. And it's my view that when, when uh, push comes to shove in November of 2024, if Donald Trump's the candidate, the American people are not going to go there. 
That's just what, that's my firm belief. I, I think that that's right. Uh, but you also need to win, and I won the biggest election victory in the history of Florida Republican Party in this most recent election. So we've shown how it's done, but you got to win on all these big fights. When you say you're going to do something, you got to dig in anything that's worth its salt to accomplish. The media is going to be against you. The left's going to be against you. Uh, a lot of establishment Republicans are going to be against you. And do you have the fortitude to stand there and fight for people and deliver big victories? I'm the only one running who has laid waste to the left in my state. I have laid waste to the Democratic Party. They are a carcass on the side of the road because we've defeated them on all these issues. And then the final thing you need is you need somebody that knows how to lead. Leadership is not about entertainment. It's not about the show. It's about setting forth a vision and executing that vision when it's not easy to do in delivering results. And, and I have the ability to do that. So I compare, I was asked the other day on a radio program, well, um, pe people like you, but they also like Trump. Why you over Trump? I'm more likely to get elected. He would be a lame duck on day one. I would serve two terms as president. We need a two-term president. He would not be able to recruit enough good personnel to serve in his administration, uh, which you need. You can't do it alone. As the president, you can make the vision and make the decisions. You need a cadre of good people who are going to be there and turn the screws on this bureaucracy. Otherwise, we're never going to get it done. Um, and I am, I'll be an executive that's not distracted. I'm not going to be focused on any of my issues. Uh, you know, my wife and I will, will, will raise our kids in the White House. I can tell you with six, five, and three, the only thing they're going to be bringing back to the White House is homework, not cocaine. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm going to be focused on your issues. I'm going to be a disciplined and, and, and focused leader in a way that, that obviously Donald Trump is not in a position uh, to be able to do that. So I view his candidacy as high risk with low reward because I think as a lame duck with poor personnel and the distractions, it's going to be hard for him to get this done. My candidacy is lower risk because we'll run Biden ragged around this country, but high reward because you get a two-term conservative president uh, who's going to stand for your values and deliver for you for eight full years. Uh, hold I, I'm going to take a little responsibility for that because I inserted the name. Just so you know how you got invited to this table, how you got invited to this Thanksgiving table, you had to 4% nationally or 4% in Iowa. We did invite the former president to be here as well, and it's okay. So you guys know how that goes with Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> Sometimes some guests don't show up. So, so we're okay. Quick question. Um, and, wa and watch your times. I want you to save some time for a close. Is, um, as you guys have been traveling, not just Iowa, but around the country, and you've been doing this for, for quite a while. I mean, taking a look at the country, you just sit and decide, I'm running for president, turn on the spigot, I'm running for president. What is the greatest moral threat that we face as a country? As you travel around, you know, what, do you, what would you say that is a moral threat to this country? I can go first. Uh, you know, I have the least time, so I'm going to go fast. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think we have told ourselves the myth that we are protecting ourselves against a tyranny of the majority. Right? Everything the left has weaponized, the civil rights laws or everything else, that we're protecting ourselves against a tyranny of the majority. The real threat that we face, the moral threat, is a tyranny of the minority in this country. I think there is a fringe minority who hates this country and what we're founded on. And you think about the paradox as one and again, the same people who say that who, the civil rights movement that began with the idea that you get ahead in this country not in the color of your skin, but not, on, not in the color of your skin, but on the content of your character, is now the movement that's been perverted to say we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. Right? The same LGBTQIA, there's so many letters, they just put a little plus at the end, movement that says the sex of the person you're attracted to on the day you're born is hardwired, even though there's no gay gene, now saying that your own biological sex is completely fluid over the course of your life, even though there's two sex chromosomes. These things don't make sense. And so I think the greatest moral threat is the rise of this new tyranny of the minority. And again, I come back to it, Bob, the only reason they're able to win, the real threat, is that they are preying on a vacuum of purpose 
and meaning. And while I have spent the last several years through my first book, Woke Inc. and others, criticizing the left for this, I think we can point the finger all we want. We have to ask what was our failure in failing to fill that moral vacuum, that spiritual and moral and national identity void. And so if we have the courage to stand for actual, what we actually stand for, individual, family, nation, God, that will beat race, gender, sexuality, and climate. But right now that moral threat is that vacuum. In individual, family, nation, God, try two to start with. But you can't be at zero, which is where we are today. That black hole is the moral threat we face, and I think we need to step up and fill that vacuum. And what another, what a great opportunity for the church. Ambassador Haley? You know, I look and what worries me the most is this national self-loathing that has taken over our country. I mean, the idea that they say America's bad or rotten or racist. I was elected the first female minority governor in history. America's not racist, we're blessed. Mm. Our kids need to know to love America. They need to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance when they start school every day. We've got to go back to what we always knew. Do you remember when you were growing up? How simple life was? How safe it felt? It was about faith, family, and country. Your parents raised you to be responsible individuals. You went to school and you learned what it meant to be successful. You went to church, and you found your faith and your conscience. We could have that again. But in order to have that again, we've got to realize how far we've drifted and come back to what makes this country so great. And when we do that, America has an amazing ability to self-correct. But you have to acknowledge we've hit rock bottom. And when you hit rock bottom, there's only one place to go. And that's up. And it's now time for us to start looking up and saying, now is the time. Now is the place. Let's get back to what made our country great in the first place. And to go back up, we're going to need leadership. Uh, I mean, Governor DeSantis. I think part of the root of all this is the elites of this country have abandoned the Constitution as the guiding light of our civic life. And you see it in a number of different ways. Uh, our founding fathers created three branches of government. They did not create a fourth branch of government, an administrative state uh, that looms over us, imposes its will on us, is even weaponized against us. Who would have thought that a mother going to a school board meeting because she's concerned about critical race theory and forced masking would earn attention from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Who would have thought that some of the things that have happened? So that is a constitution that's out of whack. It is not being uh, implemented the way our founding fathers envisioned. Think about religious freedom. You, know, you have these situations that happened. Coach Kennedy in Washington State was a football coach. Uh, he would pray at midfield after the games. Wasn't forcing anyone to do it. A lot of, a lot of the athletes wanted to do it. I went to public school. We prayed for baseball games. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, uh, but yet he lost his job because he did that. And he takes it all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and, and he wins a 6-3 to three victory, and that was framed as a victory for religious liberty. But, you know, I thought about it, and I said, the fact that that case is going to the Supreme Court shows me we've got a lot of issues with protecting religious liberty. Mm -hmm. That should not have even been a case. And what's happened in this country... And you see it with some of these other court decisions like 303 Creative, 6 to 3. So it's a victory, right? But you have three liberal justices that would have forced uh, a conservative business owner to do messages that they disagree with and that violates their conscience. Th that's bad enough. What's worse is if it was a liberal business owner being forced to do a conservative message, those three liberal justices they would have voted the other way. So how do, you, how do you make sense of that? And I think the way you make sense of it is uh, the, the left-wing elites in this country, they will say that if we want to just say under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, that that's somehow an establishment of religion. Uh, but yet they're the ones that really want to establish a religion. Yeah, they don't want to reestablish traditional religions. Their religion is leftist ideology. That's what they want this country to be governed under. So as a Christian... They will say, go to church, yeah, ha have your fun on Sunday for that one hour, but don't you dare bring that into public life. Don't actually live your life and live your faith. That, they will not abide by that. And if there's ever a conflict between you living your faith and practicing your faith and their agenda, 
they expect you to bend the knee. That is not religious freedom as our founding fathers understood it. Our founding fathers... Our founding fathers rebelled against the idea that religious freedom was basically tolerated by elites in government so that if an elite wanted you to be able to have a certain amount of freedom, you could do it. If they didn't want you, then you didn't have to. That era of toleration ended when we declared independence and said, you know, these rights do not come from the government. They come from the Lord our God. They are natural God-given rights. And that includes, of course, the right to practice your faith. That's what the Constitution codified with the First Amendment. Uh, George Washington wrote a letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport because they thanked him saying, look, we get to practice our faith in America. Can you believe that? And Washington said, isn't it a joy that you are able to practice not at the courtesy of elites, but as a matter of God-given right? That's what America is all about. So the battle for religious freedom is the left wants to return us to an era of toleration where their agenda uh, takes precedent. The rest of us have to bend the knee versus my vision, and I think most people's vision here, which is no, your right to practice and live your faith is God-given and it cannot be infringed by the government. Mm. This, this is a good segue. And this was probably a question I wasn't gonna ask, but I really wanna ask it. You talk about law of nature, law of nature's God. We believe government is an institution of God's. And we believe that according to Romans 13, those who serve in it are a minister of God. And our belief at the family leaders is that we should never lower the bar of expectation for a minister of God, especially when they hold the president of the United States. And they are looked to, not just in, in the country, in these little ones like Carthage, but all the way across the globe, a minister of God. Now, you guys are running for president. That's why I thought it was necessary that we got around the Thanksgiving table as well. Governor DeSantis, I've heard you called desanctimonious. Vivek, I've heard you called Vivek the fake. Nick, I heard you have a bird brain. They've called me names, and I'm not running for anything, okay? <laughs> My question is, how do we raise the bar of expectation again? for our children, our grandchildren, or those saying that's somebody who's a minister of God. Well, first, when you're in this thicket, look to Ephesians chapter 6. You want to exercise leadership in face of this type of fire? Put on the full armor of God. That's what you need to do to stand strong and to do what's right. And when you do that, none of this stuff ends up being effective. Uh, it's only effective if we stoop to that level. Uh, you know, you don't see me indulging in that uh, when, when I'm called, I don't even know what that name means, quite frankly, but it's fine. I'm quite frankly, I'm quite confident the former president couldn't spell it if he was put to the oh, test. Oh, but, oh, okay. you know, that's another one. Um, We're still at the Thanksgiving table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pass the gravy. Um, but I do think this, I think that uh, I, what I tell people is, um, you know, I'll be somebody that will get the job done electorally and all that, but I'll be a leader that you can be proud of. And part of that is I think that this is an office that George Washington held, father of our country. He could have been the king of America. He surrendered his sword after the uh, revolution, retired. He was called in to be president. He served two terms and said, that's enough. I'm not going to be president for life. We've had Abraham Lincoln sit in that office. You need to have the better angels of our nature guide us when you're exercising this type of leadership. The president has the ability using the bully pulpit uh, to lift people up. We need that in this country because it's been missing for far too long. Governor or Ambassador Haley. You know, Bob, the tone at the top matters because it dictates what happens afterwards. And I'll tell you when I learned how much it matters is many of you may remember we had that horrible shooting at Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina. We had 12 people do what so many do on a Wednesday night. They went to Bible study. But on that night, someone else showed up. He didn't look like them. He didn't act like them. He didn't sound like them. They didn't call the cops. They didn't throw him out. Instead, they pulled up a chair and they prayed with him for an hour. And when they bowed their heads in that last prayer, 
he began to shoot. Mm. These were people like Ethel Lance. She had lost her daughter two years prior to breast cancer, and she had a broken heart. But she would go around Mother Emanuel Church singing, One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I ask of you. Give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Tywanza Sanders, he was our youngest victim. He had just graduated college, had the world in front of him. And on that night, he stood in front of his 87-year-old great aunt Susie and looked at the killer and said, you don't have to do this. We mean no harm to you. Or it was people like Cynthia Hurd, whose life motto was just to be kinder than necessary. That's who these people were. They weren't famous, but they loved their church, they loved their community, and they loved their family. And when this happened, it brought South Carolina to our knees. Mm. It was the first time we had a shooting in a place of worship. The media came in. They wanted to define this. They wanted to make it about racism. They wanted to make it about gun control. They wanted to talk about the death penalty. And I strong-armed and said there will be a time and place we can have those discussions, but right now we have to put nine souls to rest. I didn't have the luxury because two days later, the killer's manifesto came out and he was draped in the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is a very personal issue in South Carolina. Half of the state looks at the Confederate flag as heritage and tradition. The other half looks at it as slavery and hate. I decided and told my staff the next couple of days, the Confederate flag had flown in the front of the state house for years. I said, I want you to call in four groups of people. I want you to call in the Republican leadership. I want you to call in the Democrat leadership. I want you to call in the congressional leadership. And I want you to call in our community leaders. And don't tell them why I'm calling, because I knew they wouldn't show up. And when they showed up, I told each group at 3 o'clock today, I'm going to ask for the Confederate flag to come down. And if you will stand with me, I will forever be grateful. And if you won't stand with me, I'll never let anyone know that you were in this room. I have kept my word on that. At 3 o'clock, we had blacks, whites, Republicans, Democrats, everybody stand together. But that was the easy part. In order to get the Confederate flag down, we had to have two-thirds vote of the House and two-thirds vote of the Senate. I knew how personal this issue was with the state. If 50% believed it was heritage and tradition and the other 50% thought it was slavery and hate, my job wasn't to judge either side. My job was to get them to see the best of themselves and go forward. That's what we have to do in our country, is not judge people, not hate people, not divide people, but get them to see the best of themselves, to see what we could be. We ended up going through that issue it was a tough time. It was on the heels of, of Ferguson. We didn't have riots. We had vigils. We didn't have protests. We had hugs. And we were able to get that Confederate flag down and put it in a place in a museum where it belonged. And America saw and the world saw the strength and grace of the South Carolinian people. And that's what we have to get back to again. Mm -hmm. Vivek, how do we raise the bar? You talked about it a little bit earlier, but how do you raise the bar? So I'll say, I mean, there's a time and place for everything, right? It's Book of Ecclesiastes. If I'm not it's scripture. Yep, it's in, it's in our tradition. There's a similar saying, right? And so I think that there is a time for fighting for what's right without apology. Standing up. We're, I think we're in the middle of a war in this country. It's not a war between black and white. It's not a war even between Democrat and Republican. I think it's a war between those of us who love our founding ideals and will not apologize for them and a fringe minority who hates this country and what we stand for. And so I think that's not the time to play with gentle gloves. We need somebody, a commander in chief, a general in that war who will lead us to victory. And that's not a time to, to play with kid gloves. But I guess, I mean, Solomon came after David, right? There's a time for a different style of leadership as well. And so, I mean, even, even in this campaign, <laughs> there's a time for the debate stage where we have a different kind of conversation <laughs> amongst ourselves. And then there's a time for this. And so I think that what we really require is, I think we've got to be very careful not to say that there's one temperament that we have to demand of a president because that then becomes fake. 
But we have to say, what is, what is the purpose that guides us? There's a purpose we have right now. If you all put me in that office, my purpose is to make sure we win victory in this war to stand for our shared national values. And then there's a time to unite this country. And half the people on the other side of this war are people younger than me who never learned those values in the first place. We're then going to bring them along with us. And so that's what I would say, Bob, is it's we raise the bar by understanding what's the right purpose called of us. There's a time and place for each kind of behavior. And so I'm not going to criticize our last Republican predecessor for you know, necessarily bringing a fight at a moment where a fight was required. And I think there's an element of a fight that's still required now. But I think it's going to require more than that. And I think we're going to require a leader that can reach the next generation to set that example for them. And I think that that's important too. And that has been part of what we're missing and what I hope to bring to the table. So thank you. We're coming up on the final question, but before we go to the final question, and just so the audience knows, after the final question, the closing comments, you'll get a chance to honor them. We'll go over here for some pictures and those type of things. Then we're going to allow the candidates to exit and to leave. You get some final instructions about what to do next. But uh, I just want to thank you guys, first of all, for sitting around the Thanksgiving table. Uh, I think this has been a good demonstration for the country, especially that last question. In leadership, we say it's about the cause above the self. And too often in politics, we see it about the self above the cause. In leadership, we say when something goes well, you give credit away. It's, it's him, it's her, it's he helped me, she helped me, it's them that did it. And in politics, too often we see when something goes well, that was me, that was me, that was me, that was mine. Let me talk about my, me, my, oh, oh, whatever it is. And if something goes wrong, a leader steps in and takes the blame. And in too often in politics, we see when something goes wrong, that was him, that was her, that was they, that was whatever it is. And I think right now, Ronald Reagan said in 1979 that this country hungers and thirsts for a spiritual revival. I believe right now this country hungers and thirsts for a model of leadership. And that's what I think we're looking for in the Iowa caucuses. You guys have traveled the state a lot, but we do know that January 15 is coming. And when January 15 comes, there will be a vote. And when the vote is had, uh, before the clock strikes midnight, most of you will be gone. And it, it's going to be what, I'm, what I want to ask and then turn it into your clothes about why you think these guys should take a look at your candidacy to caucus for. But when you leave Iowa, what are you going to take with you from Iowa? And Vivek, let me start with you, and then Ambassador Haley, and then Governor DeSantis. I'll put my microphone got back, which just got knocked down. <laughs> He's been doing really well, oh, by I'm, the I'm way. I'm so uh, proud of him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Carla, yes. Give him Carla a hand, huh? So here's what I'll take away. I think that we've spent a lot of time in the last 10 months traveling to the counties of this state. And you know, actually, we uh, rented an apartment here in Des Moines. So we're, we're almost native Iowans for the next couple of months as well. I'll say we've talked about all the policy questions. And I, was, I heard you talking about Reagan. When he left office, I actually don't pay attention to inauguration speeches because they're full of unfulfilled promises. I pay attention to the farewell speeches, though. Because that's where they tell you what they actually did. And of all the things that Ronald Reagan could have said that he was proud of in this country, bringing us to the near end of the Cold War, getting us out of stagflation in the Carter era, otherwise growing this economy, here's what he said when he left in January of 1989. He said that we revived a national character that we lacked when I took office in 1981. That's what he was most proud of. And I think the thing that comes across in, the, in my discussions with Iowans, but I think Part of why we're doing this in Iowa is it's representative of the country. It's people are hungry for a revival of that national character. So, so what do I want to say in January 2033, if you all put us there after two terms, leaving that White House? And this, this guy won't even be in high school yet. And I don't think we're working with a lot of time. If he's out of high school before we get this right, I don't think we have a country left. I want to tell you we shut down the deep state. We declared independence from China. We stayed out of World War III. We grew this economy. Those are the things that I began this campaign talking about. But I think the thing I'll take away from here is 
if we can revive our national character, answer who we are, that becomes that much easier. Revive national pride in these guys' generation that's missing today when 60% of young Americans say they would sooner give up their right to vote than to give up their access to TikTok. That's, I think, a crisis of national pride. And I hope that when we leave that White House, all the policy decisions, great. But the lesson you all have taught me, I think probably, probably speak for all of us here, probably taught us, is that there's more to this job than just the policy. It is reviving who we are as Americans. We lack a good answer to that question. You ask somebody my age, in our generation, that question, you get a blank stare in response. It's like a deer in the headlights. If we can answer that question, say this is who we are as Americans, then the rest of it, when we have our policy debates about the economy to foreign policy, becomes that much easier. And you have sent me, you will have sent, I think, all of us on a mission to answer that question as we leave this state on January 15th. And so, I'm thank you. I'm grateful for what you've given us and what we've learned from this process. It's been part of why we keep the caucus the way it is. And, you know, if you all do your part, I'm sure whoever on this stage or off serves as our next president, we will do ours and remember that what we took away from Iowa. And so thank you all for that. <laughs> thank you. And I'm proud of this guy. Yeah. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I winked at Karthik, and he's like, oh, you're out of time, Dad. Yeah. You're out of time. It's true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Haley. You know, I've loved our time in Iowa. I have lost count of how many town halls we are really talking to people, learning about what they care about. You know, you want to see us multiple times. You want to ask us every question. You want to shake every hand. And it's very comfortable for me because South Carolina is the same way. But what I take from Iowans is they really have such a love of country. It really is such a love of our country. And I will tell you, you know, I am the proud wife of a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan. And five months ago, I dropped my husband Michael off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they've never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to fight for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for our country here? Because we have a country to save. But we can do this. But in order to do this, we've got to acknowledge some hard truths. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. We should not be proud of that. We should want to win the majority of Americans. And the way you do that is you have to have a new generational leader. We've got to leave the negativity and the baggage behind us. And we've got to start looking forward. But I promise you, that if we do this, it's going to require everybody in this room showing a lot of courage. The three of us having courage to run and every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this caucus. Mm. It matters. Amen. It matters. Amen. Well said. <laughs> Governor DeSantis. Well, um, I think my wife and I, so we, we've done 94 of 99 counties uh, in Iowa we visited. We're going to have 98 done by the end of this weekend, and then we're going to save that 99th for a, for a big, big announcement at some time in the not too distant future. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, we, we've had great experiences. I mean, we took our three kids to play baseball at the Field of Dreams in Dyersville, Iowa. I remember that movie when I was a kid. I mean, it was really, really neat and all that. But uh, I take away uh, from my experience here, the uh, thing I take away is hope. Because you see all the negativity, you see the media, you see tech companies, you see all the things people want to do uh, to, to get you down, to, to build the pessimism. But what you see in Iowa are people that uh, believe in this country, uh, have faith in God, understand the importance of family, uh, and, and work hard 
uh, to provide a better life for themselves and their family. And, and that's the core of, of what we need to reverse the decline in this country. We have it. Uh, we just need to bring it to the surface. And Iowa, I think, proves that. I think what we've done in Florida proves that. Uh, that that can happen. So uh, I've enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the next 59 days and uh, being the probably I think I'm in the only can county that's uh, candidates actually doing the full grassley. I think it's an important tradition. I think you got to show up everywhere. I, I think you got to meet people and you have to earn support from Iowans and that's exactly what we've done. Governor Ron DeSantis. I hope you, like me, believe this is well worth your time, sitting around the Thanksgiving table having a conversation, an adult conversation, about the future of the country. Do I get my two minutes? No, no, I'm taking those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, recognize your presidential candidates campaigning in the state of Iowa.